Hello, I'm Jerry Scheidbach, pastor of the Lighthouse Baptist Church in Santa Maria, California, and I'm your brain masseur. Let's look at a, a verse of scripture that uh, articulates a principle we need to look at this morning as we think about whether or not the Senate should use the nuclear option. The Bible says in Jeremiah 48, verse 10, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from the blood. I made some notes here to... Uh, Help me remember all the things I want to bring out. Let's take a look at it. My friends, we are engaged in a great ideological war. And this war is for our liberties and for our freedom. And this war is against an enemy that is determined to take away our liberties, take away our freedoms, and to enslave us. In show number 615, I presented an argument for using the nuclear option. Now, to summarize, essentially, that argument is this. The nuclear option is constitutional, and it should be used for its intended purpose. And I think we have such a purpose before us right now. Now, by constitutional, what I mean is the Constitution provides for the House of Representatives and for the Senate to establish their own protocols. By that, I mean the rules of procedure in doing their work and getting their job done. Therefore, it is constitutional for the Senate to make these rules. Among the rules that the Senate has constitutionally established, there is something called the filibuster. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Uh, that's uh, a, an important mechanism whereby the minority in the Senate have some voice, some influence, in the decisions the Senate makes. Essentially, the filibuster allows the minority to delay indefinitely a vote on a bill that they oppose. A filibuster can be busted. There is a provision for the Senate to break a filibuster, but it requires a three-quarters majority vote to stop or to break a filibuster. Or in other words, what they call a supermajority. And then there is another rule. That rule allows the Senate to, well, change the rules. <laughs> it's a rule that provides to the Senate the power by a simple majority vote to, in this case, remove the weapon of a filibuster from the hands of the, ma of the minority. And it's called the nuclear option. It's called that because the Senate is understandably loathe to willy-nilly change the rules. Now, that would undermine the Republican ideal of governing according to law, uh, or of respecting the rules, and so on. In this case, uh, according to well-established rules. And by doing that, they fear they would undermine the whole principle of governing or proceeding according to rules. Now, when it comes to the filibuster, the concern goes deeper, however, than uh, only a concern about rule of law and proceeding according to rules. When it comes to the filibuster, there's another Republican ideal that's being protected, and that is the ideal of protecting the voice of the minority. In other words, in a republic, as I hope you know, it's not about the majority rules. It's about governance under law. And so it's important that we protect the voice of the minority, that the minority has a voice in our government. And so that's a Republican ideal. And it's one of the things that undergirds or underpins the whole idea of providing for filibuster. Now, together, these rules, the filibuster and the rule of law versus the rule of the majority, are expressive of yet another Republican ideal, and that is the ideal of bipartisanship. Now, you've heard that thrown around a lot, and you, I'm sure, understand the meaning. The bipartisan idea is that both parties contribute to the framing and the making of our laws. And in that way, it's hoped um, that we would secure laws or establish laws that have the broadest possible support in the population. Republicans actually care about these Republican ideals. Democrats, frankly, do not. The only time the Democrats 
make any noise about uh, the importance of these ideals is when they are in the minority, when they are not in power. When they're in power, they trample all over these ideals. For example, they were in power when the Democrats tried to push or did push Obamacare legislation into law. They declared themselves unwilling, I mean openly declared themselves unwilling to wrangle and to go on and on and debate with the opposition party or the minority party. They decided to go alone. Forget bipartisanship, in other words. Rather than follow the Republican principle of compromise to consensus, uh, they abandoned any pretense of working with the minority party. And they just literally pushed the Republicans, the minority party, aside, marginalized them, and just dismissed them, basically. You might as well have said, go home, we'll take care of this. And uh, remove from them any opportunity to have any voice by all kinds of machinations and tricks and things that we won't go back over right now. They're pretty well known. So they forsook the tradition of bipartisanship. Well, furthermore, they compromised the integrity of the rule of law principle. I mean, in principle. You know, the principle of protecting the minority voice. <laughs> they just dismissed it. And, and they did that by using what's called the nuclear option. They just simply changed the rules and took away the power of the filibuster from the minority members, which essentially marginalized them completely, removed them entirely from the legislative process. When the Republicans were returned to power, to majority, in both houses, one of the first things they did was reinstate the filibuster. Hmm. You see, the Republicans actually care about these ideals. The Democrats, frankly, do not. However, the nuclear option is there for a reason. There is a reason that the Senate has a rule that allows them to change these rules when necessary. And when you're using this rule as it was intended to be used, then it's certainly a constitutional and appropriate thing to do. And I think using the rule to preserve the republic to reestablish these Republican ideals would be a good reason to use it. The Democrats have no respect for Republican ideals, as we already know, um, you know, unless they're not in power. When they're in the minority, then it becomes real important to them. They used the nuclear option to take liberty away from Americans, to legislate contrary to the will of the people, to further the purpose of those who would transform America as it was founded and to an America that many of us can hardly recognize anymore. A socialist, or at least a socialist light country. Therefore, I argued in show number 615 that the Republicans need to use the nuclear option. They need to take the weapon of the filibuster from the minority since they intend to use it to protect legislation that they railroaded into law by removing the filibuster. Think about that. In other words, they got Obamacare into law by violating these important Republican ideals. And now they want to play this game of using these Republican ideals to protect the law now that they're in the minority. Somehow that doesn't even seem fair, and fairness is something I think most Democrats at least think about from time to time. <laughs> Since the nuclear option was put in place to protect the Senate from the case, or a case, where an individual or a minority might use the filibuster inappropriately to bar the Senate from doing its job of protecting the Constitution, the rule of law, well, then this is a case where it should be used. Today, I want to add to my argument supporting the use of the nuclear option, that is, changing the rules of the Senate, removing the weapon of the filibuster from the hands of those who would use it to stop the Senate from doing what must be done to protect our constitutional form of government and our liberties and freedoms. Folks, one must have the courage to take extreme measures when they're called for.
to defeat an aggressive, unrelenting, irrational, and ideological committed foe, it is often necessary to take such extreme measures. Let me give you an example. In uh, 1940s Japanese culture, uh, that, the people, the ideology of, of that people was shaped by belief that was intractable, rigidly fixed, entrenched against reason, and the defatigable enemy that was quite literally undefeatable. Except for the very real threat of annihilation, they would never have surrendered. Now, there was a man named Mr. Compton, who was one of the scientists that worked on the A-bomb, and he was attached to MacArthur in the month leading up to uh, the decision to deploy the A-bomb, he was also in Japan for about a month after their surrender. And he was one of those officers involved in interrogating the Japanese officers. One Japanese officer was asked, what would likely have been the next major move if the war had continued? Well, that Japanese officer startled the interrogators, in part because of how accurately he predicted what America planned to do. They knew where America was going to evade, and they had a pretty good idea of when. And also partly because of the statement that he made. This Japanese officer said that even though Japan, I mean the officers and the leadership of Japan knew that it would most likely not be able to stop an American invasion, Japan was nevertheless determined to fight to the last man standing. Because in their way of thinking, that would mean they were not defeated. That would be a way of protecting their honor. Now what he meant is that Japan would have fought so long as there was one Japanese soldier left to swing a sword or pull a trigger. You see, the Japanese soldiers, they didn't know they had lost. They believed they were actually winning the war. That's what they were told. <laughs> they were told there were losses at Iwo Jima, and Okinawa uh, was uh, all high-level strategy ploy to draw us in, to bring us to their island where they would then uh, wipe out the American army. That's what they were told. Well, that confirmed the concerns of Marshall, MacArthur, and all the rest, and Truman, that even though Japan had lost the war, Japan would have continued and would not surrender they would have continued on a war footing against America indefinitely, and this thing would have, we'd be still fighting them today. It was clear that the invasion plan for November 1st was anticipated by Japan, that fighting on their homeland would, without any doubt, have been even more ferocious than the way they held their ground at Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And so the cost of such an invasion was estimated from the hundreds of thousands into a million or more casualties. Now, in face of this ideological army, intractable, rigidly fixed, entrenched against reason, an indefatigable army, an enemy that was quite literally undefeatable, it was decided that unless extreme measures were taken, measures available to them at the time, measures that were so extreme that no one throughout Japan could possibly ignore or miss the message. Measures that would destroy all the lies, that would expose the lies of the government that they were still winning. Lies that would keep the people believing that they were going to win and keep them fighting. Well, they decided to go nuclear, to drop the big bomb. First on Hiroshima, and then on Nagasaki. Now, did this bring about the conclusion of the war? That's argued sometimes. Well, from someone who was there, quote, the facts are these. On July 26, 1945, the Potsdam ultimatum called on Japan to surrender unconditionally. On July 29, Premier Suzuki issued a statement purportedly at a cabinet press conference scorning as unworthy an official notice of the surrender ultimatum and emphasizing the increasing rate of Japanese aircraft production. Well, what does that tell you? Well, eight days later on August 6th, 
The, the first atomic bomb was dropped in Hiroshima. And the second was dropped on August 9 on Nagasaki. On the following day, August 10, Japan declared its intention to surrender. And then on August 14, Japan adopted the Potsdam terms, end quote. Well, what does that tell you? Clearly, the bomb got their attention and uh, broke their resolve to continue the war. Clearly, the nuclear option got Japan's attention, and a speedy end of the war was a result. If Truman, Marshall, et al., had been the sort who were queasy about unleashing such a devastating show of force, if they had been the type, you know, that would keep back the sword from the blood, or they would have prolonged the conflict, and almost certainly would have cost a great deal more blood. Now let me give you an example. The carpet bombing that we did on Japan in, uh, by the B-29 bombers in, uh, in about, about a month or so leading into the, uh, the deployment of the big bomb. Did you know that that carpet bombing activity uh, killed over 220,000 Japanese people? Did you know that these raids, the, the B-29 bombers going through and, and dropping these bombs on, on the incendiary bombs, you know that they wiped out about 125 square miles of Japan? And did you know by contrast that the nuclear option killed about 80,000 in Hiroshima? Which is devastating, but still, think about this. And then 45,000 in Nagasaki. And by contrast, did you know that Hiroshima uh, it wiped out about 10 square miles, as opposed to 125 square miles? and maybe another eight square miles of lesser damage and so on. The, the point I'm making is that using the nuclear option was a way of sending a clear message to the entire island, you know, that Godzilla just rose up out of the ocean and stepped onto their island. And it got their attention, it broke their resolve, and they stopped the war and it stopped the bloodshed. The nuclear option was the only option available to us capable of breaking the will of the Dominable Japanese ideological soldier. And I'm convinced it is the only option available now to defeat an equally intractable, rigidly fixed enemy that is entrenched against reason, who has proved themselves to be indefatigable, an enemy that simply and clearly is not going to give up or, or accept defeat. They just simply don't. The only way to stop this is to use the nuclear option. Not I mean physically here, of course. I do mean politically. Look, here's what you need to understand. We are no longer dealing with a situation where both sides want the same thing. It's just an argument on how to proceed to get there. We are at a place in this country where uh, there are two very different visions for America. One that looks to our founding fathers and founding principles and another, quite frankly, that's looking to Karl Marx and other mass murderers. One that's looking back toward the roots of liberty and the other that's looking forward toward tyranny. You know, and until their ability to continue their war on our republic is simply taken away from them, well, they're going to continue this war against our freedoms and against our liberties. And of course, I'm talking about the Democrats, as I like to teasingly call them. I'm talking about using the so-called nuclear option in the Senate. And uh, I'm talking about taking the weapon called the filibuster out of the hands of uh, the enemies of our liberty. And that's where we are these days. Listen, you know, when you defeat an enemy, you don't <laughs> leave in their hands the weapons they can use to continue to shoot you. You see, and herein is the problem, my friends. Only one side right now, it seems, in this conflict or in this war, seemed to understand that it is a war. <laughs> but that's exactly how the Dems see it. They see themselves as ideological warriors engaged in a war to take this country out from under God and to take it into a purely secularist, humanistic society. And they fight to advance their agenda like soldiers advancing on a strategic objective of war. For example, to get Obamacare into law, remember, they use the nuclear option. And that's because they believe their cause 
is so critical and important that they're justified in doing anything and everything necessary to push their agenda forward. They will drop the bomb to advance socialism in America. We'd better be willing to drop it to protect liberty and freedom. But Republicans have until recently refused to see this as anything more than politics as usual. You know? The same old gentlemanly process of compromise to consensus politics. I don't despise that, but I'm telling you right now, that's not where we are. The only time Dems want to play compromise to consensus is when they're no longer in control. When they're in control, it's all drop the bomb. Listen, you must use what force you have to defeat an intractable enemy. They see us as their enemy. And they regard us as an enemy that must be defeated at all costs. They are a fierce ideological army that's deployed, quite frankly, throughout our bureaucracy, especially throughout the education bureaucracy of this country, constantly working to overthrow our constitutional liberties with an aim to enslave us to their controlling power, to their vision for America. And until our conservative leadership wakes up and understands that this is not a politics-as-usual battlefield, you know, that gentlemanly process of compromise to consensus at this point only plays into the hands of our enemies. Listen, we watched what you, and I'm speaking to you, Democrats, we watched what you did. We watched you force Obamacare into law. We watched what you did with power when you had it. We know who you are. We know what you're up to. We know what you did. You violated process. You stomped all over process. You spit in the face of bipartisanship. You trampled upon the principle of gentlemanly compromise to consensus politics. You even went so far as to trample upon the Constitution itself from time to time, or to kick it at its edges, that's for sure. You have shown us that you, and I mean Obama, Hillary, Reid, and the rest of the ring leaders of that marauding bunch that, you know, ravaged our economy, trashed our traditional American values, trampled upon our Constitution, wiped your filthy feet on our Declaration of Independence. We were there when you did all that. How dare you come back now, point your finger at us, and say we can't defend ourselves against this kind of thing. You know, we get it. We're at war. You've convinced us. We are at war. You are at war against our way of life, against our freedoms, against our liberties, against America as founded. This is war. Okay. Make no mistake about it. You declared it, and so now we must fight it. Thank God it's not broken out into armed conflict. But I've, and I've been saying this for about a year and a half, two years, something like that, I'll tell you. Unless our conservative leadership gets the message and understands that war has been declared on our Constitution, on our Declaration of Independence, on, on our liberties, on our freedoms, and rise up as soldiers and do what needs to be done to protect us, I'm afraid it might turn into an armed conflict situation. God help us. I mean, the gloves would just be dropped and we'll be going at it in the streets. You see, Americans, real, as they say, red-blooded American types, are not going to be enslaved. Won't happen. They're going to fight. I mean, you know, remember the revolution. It's just, it's not in our DNA. So I beg you, do what must be done. Go nuclear if necessary. Don't hold back the sword from blood. So, as I conclude, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And this just, doesn't this just make sense? If the dims cry foul, unfair, against us going nuclear, you know, using the nuclear option, what, what is their argument? 
<laughs> is the argument that it's wrong? Well, they did it. If it's cheating to use the nuclear option, then does it make any sense that they get to keep the winnings of their cheating? No. Don't fall for that one. Use the nuclear option to restore and protect our liberties.